Ours is about the only age in the history of the world that has denied human guilt. Today, almost everyone is immaculately conceived. It used to be the unique privilege of the Blessed Mother. She identified it with herself and said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now everyone is immaculate. Even in the church, the dismissal to a great extent of penance, confession, reparation, fits in with the modern tempo which Dostoevsky prophesied. That great Russian novelist of the last century said a time is coming when men will say there is no sin, there is no guilt, there is only hunger. And men will come crying and fawning to our feet saying, give us bread. How is sin done away with in our modern culture? Well, first of all, by turning penitence into patience and sinners into the sick. Almost all guilt today is supposed to be abnormal. Now, guilt does very often have an abnormal manifestation. But the abnormal manifestation of guilt in no way belies a real guilt beneath. Take, for example, Lady Macbeth. Here is Shakespeare, who lived from when? 1564 to 1616, long before we had psychiatry. And he gave two perfect examples of psychosis and neurosis. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth contrived the murder of the king. Macbeth had a psychosis. He saw constantly before him the instrument of murder. What is this that I see before me? A dagger? with a handle toward my hand. There was no dagger. That's abnormal guilt. But the real guilt, the murder of the king. Lady Macbeth washed her hands every quarter of an hour. She could not erase the blood. Are not all the waters of the seven seas enough to wash this blood and carnadine from my hands? In modernizing Shakespeare, the abnormal manifestation of guilt is supposed to be a proof that there is no guilt. But there is. I was once instructing a stewardess on an international airline. She had already had about 15 hours of instruction. This was on confession. At the end of the instruction, she said, Well, this is the end. Now I'll never come into the church after hearing this instruction on confession. Well, I said, Take one hour more from me, and then you may quit if you wish. At the end of the next hour, she was in a trauma. She shrieked. Shouted, let me out of here. Now I'll never become a Catholic. I said, my dear girl, there's absolutely no proportion between what you heard and the way you were acting. Have you had an abortion? She said, yes. She finished her instructions. I later on witnessed her marriage and later on baptized a baby. 
Do not be fooled by those who will lead you down long trails of argumentation. Pay little attention to what people say. Pay attention to why they say it. I might have gone on with many hours of instruction on confession, but the problem was guilt. <coughs> so this is one escape. The other is rationalization of a peculiar kind. The rationalization today is taking place very often in the social order. Why do we have this mad rush to the social order? Is it because we love neighbor? If so, fine. Is it because the love of God impels us to neighbor? Is it because we wish, we wish to concretize our love of God? Or is there another reason? In our meditation tomorrow night, we will discover one reason for it. We find one in the Old Testament, too. Remember King David was one day on his penthouse. He saw on the opposite penthouse Bathsheba. He invited her over to see his etchings. He loved her not wisely, but too well. And in the due course of time, she is found with child. The husband, Uriah, was at war. He brings Uriah home, and he says to him, You've been fighting hard. Go back to your wife. He said, I can't go back. We're at war. David wanted to blame paternity onto the husband. David got him drunk. Uriah slept at David's front door. So David sent for the general and said, Some men must die in battle. Put Uriah up in the front. Maybe he will be killed. Uriah was killed. Did it bother David? Not in the least, for months. One day the prophet David came to him and said, David, we have a great social problem. There's a rich man who's gone over to a poor neighbor. He stole his little ewe lamb. And he made a feast for a visitor. What shall we do? David said, that man shall die, and he shall restore fourfold the property that he has stolen. Nathan said, thou art the man. You stole a ewe lamb that belonged to Uriah. You are guilty of murder. David was honest enough to see his guilt and wrote Miserere May. As a result. But notice the rationalization. I'm afraid that today there are some who are tremendously interested in social justice because they've lost individual justice of their own soul in relationship to God. They become wrathful, angry men against the injustices of others and have already neglected the primal justice to God. Believe me, one has to have clean hands to be a great defender of the social order. It can never be a palliative for a bad conscience. So this rationalization is another escape.
With the denial of sin, we are here faced with the biblical idea that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Why is that? Why cannot washing sand, washing in sand, purify to the Muslims? Why cannot stretching out on a psychological analytical couch to have sins explained away do away with guilt? Why does scripture say blood, blood alone forgives sin? What is this victimal mystery hidden in blood? Well, for two reasons. First of all, sin is an offense against God. And the sinner deserves to die, and life is in the blood. And hence the shedding of blood would be the symbol that one was giving up his life in reparation for his sin. That's one reason. And that's the reason that we found, we find in Leviticus. Another reason is sin is in the blood. It's in every alley and gateway of the body. It's in every fissure of the brain. It's in the blood of the alcoholic. It's in the blood of the degenerate. It's in the new plague. Today, where nature seems to be seated in judgment with the plague of gonorrhea and syphilis afflicting the nation. Diseases are written in the blood and diseases are a result of sin and an abuse of freedom. And if sin is in the blood, then somehow or other blood has to be poured out. We have to empty ourselves of it. That would be another reason. But in any case, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Let us then begin the story of what might be called the scarlet cord. Remember when Moses sent his spies, twelve spies, into the Holy Land? They hid in the house of Rahab, who was a prostitute that had her house on the wall. And Rahab said to the spies, your God is the true God, and I know he's the true God. And God is going to deliver us into your hands, so when you come, spare me, spare my father, spare my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. And Joshua and Caleb said, when we come, drop a scarlet cord out of the window over the wall. We will know your house, and we will see that scarlet cord, and everyone in the house will be saved. Let us call that scarlet cord the symbol of blood. And begin the story now of the forgiveness of sin. Our first parents abuse freedom. They find themselves naked. That's because the aura of grace, original justice, which covered them, glorified their body. There was a great aura of beauty around it. As our blessed Lord, body must have been at the resurrection. Now, when this inner clothing of grace was lost, they found themselves naked. Very often, the less luxury we have in our soul, the more we have to put it on on the outside. Now they found themselves naked. They were ashamed. Shame is exposure. To cover up their shame, they made for themselves fig leaves. The fig leaves dried.
they were exposed again. How was their shame covered up? This, I think, is a great test question for how well one reads Scripture. How was the shame of Adam and Eve covered? Read the third twenty-first verse of the third chapter of Genesis. Just a simple line. in which God made for them the skins of animals and clothed them. God did it. Note here three things. One, God did it. Two, the covering up of the shame was done vicariously. That is to say, someone else was sacrificed. Thirdly, there was the shedding of blood. The three elements that you will always find throughout Scripture. God ordained, vicarious, and the shedding of blood. <coughs> Cain now offers a sacrifice of the first fruits. It is not acceptable to God. Abel offered the firstling of the flock, which was. And why? Because he had observed the Adamic tradition. He knew that the sacrifice had to be a sacrifice of blood. And Cain began a long tradition. See, the tradition of all who would deny redemption, who would deny the blood of Christ, who would deny victimhood, which has crept into our priesthood, just insisting on the priesthood, without any idea of expiation. So the sacrifice of Abel was acceptable. Noah offered a blood sacrifice. We come to Abraham. Here is a man of tremendous faith who leaves the land without knowing exactly where he's going. God said, I will appoint the land to which you are going. He becomes the father of three great peoples, the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims. All trace their origin back to him. He takes with him out of the land of, of her, his beautiful wife, Sarah. And God said, you are going to have a progeny as numerous as the sands of the sea and the birds of the air. At 80, he has no heir. And Sarah is seven. He said she suggests consorting with a British maid, Agar, from which is born Ishmael, who was not the son of promise, because Sarah was to be the mother. When he's almost a hundred and Sarah's ninety, he's rejuvenated by a miracle, and there is born the son Isaac. And God now says to him, You sacrifice that son. Your only son. So the father prepares to sacrifice his only son. For three days the son is dead, for it takes three days to grow up the mount. And when finally they come to the mount, when Isaac takes the wood off his shoulder, he says to his father, Where is the lamb? Where's the lamb? Somehow or other those words were caught up. They rang out from that mountaintop. They rang 
down the centuries. Where's the lamb? Jews brought him to thraldom in Egypt. Pharaoh refuses to let the people go, even after wonders and miracles by God, and God finally says, Moses, kill a lamb, one year old, without blemish. Take the blood of that lamb and sprinkle it all over the top of your door, doorpost. Not on the floor, blood sacred. Let no one walk on it. God said, I will send out tonight the angel of destruction will destroy the firstborn of every beast and every living thing in all Egypt. And when the angel sees the blood over that doorpost, the angel will pass over that house and that house will be saved. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And then began the Passover sacrifice. Renewed once the Jews had crossed over the Jordan and came back into the promised land. Then began divine ordinances to make clear some other mysteries, particularly the vicariousness of it. So each year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would take a uh, two goats, you would cast lots. Which of the two will you that I release to you? And over one goat, the priest would put his hands, as we do at the Mass, and lay on that goat all the sins of Israel. The other goat would be killed, and the blood of the killed goat would be sprinkled on the goat bearing the sins would be driven off into the wilderness, the scapegoat. The sins were forgiven. Same ceremony with the two birds to symbolize the curing of leprosy. There almost seems to have been in the Jewish religion a veritable hemorrhage of blood. Every family had to bring blood, I mean a lamb. If the family was poor, twenty could unite. Anyway. And then it would be killed and the blood sprinkled in four directions. Moses would sprinkle it on the people. This is a sign of a covenant. This is our agreement. This is our pact with God. Blood. We're in the book of Leviticus. If any Israel, light or alien, settled in Israel, eats any blood, I will set my face against the eater and cut him off from his people. Because the life of a creature is in the blood is and I appointed to make expiation on the altar for you. It is the blood that is life that makes expiation. So they were not to touch that blood. Someone was reserving blood for himself. And on and on the sacrifices go. Josephus tells us that about 20 or 30 years after the death of Christ, there were 260,000 lambs offered in the temple of Jerusalem. The blood of the lambs used to flow down the book of Kedron. Finally, we come to John the Baptist. It's Passover time. John the Baptist is preaching at the Jordan. Here's that heavily trafficked road over the Jordan and up just a quarter of a mile to Jericho and then 20 miles or more up to Jerusalem. And as John the Baptist preaches, here he can see all of the people.
people bringing their lambs. Red and purple ribbons tied about the Paschal Lamb by the children. The older ones carrying the Paschal Lamb. And it seemed like an endless procession of lambs bound for sacrifice. And the question echoed from the sacrifice of Abraham. Where is the Lamb? Where is the Lamb? And as John views this procession, suddenly he looks up, and he sees a figure among the crowd, and he says, There's the Lamb of God! Who takes away the sin of the world. There is the Lamb. And the Lamb came for only one purpose. To shed blood in expiation for the sins of the world. So that in the Garden of Gethsemane, the thought of the world's sins bore into his soul and he sweated red beads forming the first rosary on the crimson roots of the Garden of Gethsemane. Then on the cross emptied his, his blood through four fountains and finally through the heart as the divine miser just stores up some of his last drops of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews takes us back to that ceremony. First of all, when the high priest entered the Holy of Holies once a year, and he could enter only once a year. And he would take the blood of the lamb and he would sprinkle it on that curtain. And then he would go into the curtain to the Holy of Holies. And in that Holy of Holies was originally the rod of Aaron, tables of the law, and some of the manna. And the writer to the epistle of the of the epistle of the Hebrews. The priests are always entering the first tent in discharge of the duty, but the second is entered only once a year, and by the high priest alone, and even then he must take with him the blood which he offers on his own behalf and for the people's sins of ignorance. All this is symbolic. And now we come to this verse. The blood of Jesus makes us free to enter boldly into the sanctuary. By the new living way which he has opened for us through the curtain, the way of the flesh. In other words, this great hyacinth and purple and crimson curtain that was 65 feet high in the temple of Jerusalem was a symbol of the flesh of Christ. And when our Lord was on the cross, a soldier pierced his heart and blood and water came out. And at that moment, the veil of the temple was rent, not from bottom to top, for a man might do that, but from top to bottom. And the Holy of Holies was revealed, but that was only the symbol of the Holy of Holies that was revealed on the cross when the heart was pierced. Heaven was open, the heart of God was revealed. Heaven 
is now ours. The high priest has entered his sanctuary. This is the mystery of the blood. And we are custodians of it. We hold it in our hands. How reverently. We execute that mystery. When we give communion, we're sprinkling people with the blood of Christ. The blood of the new. And everlasting covenant. Every time we raise our hand in the confessional box, blood is dropping from our fingers. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Every anointing, every administration of the sacrament, every increase of grace and every initiation of grace comes from blood. Blood. The blood of the victim. This is the mystery of our faith. Sin, therefore, is not the worst thing in the world. What is the worst thing in the world? The denial of sin. If I am blind and deny there's any such thing as light, will I ever see? If I am deaf and deny there are harmonies, will I ever hear? And if I deny that I am a sinner, will I ever be forgiven? This is the unforgivable sin. The denial of sin. Where it makes forgiveness impossible. Sin, then, is not the breaking of a law. Who is sorry for breaking a law? There isn't a one of us here who drives a car who hasn't broken the speed limit a thousand times. And there isn't a single one of us here, when we got into a garage, ever leaned over on the steering wheel and set an act of contrition for breaking the speed limit. No one is sorry for breaking the law. What is sin? Sin is hurting someone we love. That is what sin is. So the crucifix then is my own autobiography. The life of each and every one of us has been written. I can read any greed in the nail in the hand. I can read my lust in the torrent flesh. I can read my wandering away from his mercies and his solicitations of grace and the feet that were pierced. All false loves are in that wounded side. The ink, it is his blood. The pen, it is the nail. In the parchment, it is his flesh. This is where forgiveness of sin starts. And there is a personal equation between the crucifix and ourselves. And that's one of the reasons, I think, today, why with the denial of guilt, the crucifix is beginning to disappear. I once gave a retreat in a retreat house where there had not been a crucifix in 12 years. And I began a sermon, I looked for the crucifix, didn't see any. And one woman shouted out, but I know a priest who's got one in his room. So revive the love of the crucifix and make your meditations before it. This is the story of our forgiveness, and this is the story of our, our great and holy mission. 
If I if I had time, but we do not have time, I would take this story into the apocalypse, where the word lamb is mentioned twenty seven times. And there's very often an interesting touch in the way the Holy Spirit uses certain words. In the Gospel, the word that is used for lamb always is amnos. In the Apocalypse, St. John does not use that word. He uses arnion. Arnion is a pet lamb. Christ the lamb, slain from the beginning of the world. The pet lamb of our salvation. And this brings us back to the theme of our retreat. We are priests and we are victims. And Christ is a sanctuary of victims. Not a teacher, not a king, not a social worker, not a revolutionist, not a politician, not a sociologist. He's none of these things. He's Savior. And that's the meaning of Jesus. His name shall be called Jesus because he saved us from our sins. And this is the great consolation that we priests can always have, knowing him so well and knowing ourselves so well. If we had never sinned, we never could call Jesus Savior.